Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Oh, it's brilliant to see your faces and some new faces. Oh, and Stephen! Woo <laughs> I was excited when I heard you come, Stephen. Last time I saw Stephen, it was at a boxing match, and his niece was boxing, and she asked us to come, and I went, oh, I'm scared. So, but we went, and she won the match. We prayed she win. And bless her. She was on the floor with her opponent after she knocked her out. And, and they, were sitting, they were cuddling and hugging each other like best friends. So, um, anyway, so God was with us and he was with Stephen as well. And uh, he's with you this morning. He's with Billy. He's with um, Michelle. He's with Claire. He's with Colin. He's, who's Colin? I don't know who's Colin here. I've got Colin on the brain this morning. Is there a Colin here? No. See what I mean? I'm not a big kid. Next week. But Next week. the wonderful thing is, friend, Brent's here as well, our dear friend from, I was going to say Australia, but no, he's from America. Brent's from America. And he's become a really good friend of the house here, the church here. Karen's not had much sleep. I'm not even sure. <laughs> but, you know, God never sleeps. Wow! He is here, he is there, he is everywhere. He's omnipresent, he is with us this morning. Is that brilliant? I love it. But he is also sings over us when we are sleeping, which is an amazing thing. And I love that. Because sometimes we take a little bit of time to go to sleep because there's so many things in our mind. But he loves to sing over us and bless us. And he wants to. Oh, he is ready for you to sing to him this morning and worship him. Isn't that good? Yeah. So I, I'm just going to read this. <coughs> Thanksgiving and prayer. It's Philippians 1. I thank my God every time I remember you. All my prayers for all of you. I will, I always pray with joy. I always pray with joy. How often do we pray for, with joy? We pray for joy, with joy. I'm for joy. I've got a friend called Joy. I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. And being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you, in you, will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. Wow, so amazing. He began a good work in us. It's not wonderful, not a bad work in us. The devil does bad works in us. But the Lord God does good works in us. And he carries it on till completion. And we run the race. We don't give up until the finish line. And we have the cheering from all those in heaven that's gone before. And the cheer is on. Keep going, keep going. You can do this. Run. Run the good race. I carry it on. Being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Jesus Christ. Isn't that wonderful? He doesn't give up on us. Don't give up on him. Don't give up on him. In one time to heart, lean into him. Hear his heart beat and worship the king. Kings. Amen. Let's worship God.
begin to turn your heart towards him, just allow that praise to rise up. Let that scripture soak in. That he who started, he who began a good work in you, he will bring it to completion.
If you look around the world and you think the world's a mess, and it is, and you think, oh, what's the solution? I'll tell you the solution. It's Jesus. <laughs> Only Jesus. And he provided a way for his blood. Precious blood. The blood of Jesus made a way for us. Keep going, keep going, because that's good. So I might come back to that. Jesus is the answer. Jesus is the answer. The precious blood of Jesus we share so that you and I can experience freedom. Freedom to be who he created us as to be. That's the God we serve. And maybe you don't serve him, but that's the God who we worship. Jesus.
forces to grow us. The Bible says, where we build up this of treasure, here on earth, where rust, thieves can't take it, lick it, or would you rather be in heaven? The older I'm getting, the more I'm learning. It's better to be out there. Spirit, I need you this morning. <laughs> I just need you. Give me the words to say. What needs to be said? Give me a word that shapes this place.
for the folks. You're the reason we're here. We need you. We have an unbelieving world. It feels like at times it's closing on every side of the church. For too long we've allowed an unbelieving generation and an unbelieving world to dictate what we say and what we do. Lord, I pray that in Jesus' people would rise up. That Jesus' people would rise up. And fear nothing more than sin. And love you nothing more than God. Come Holy Spirit. Well, after preaching about eight hours yesterday and ministering for about four, I think I might have squeezed in my 12 hours. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was sitting there as they were singing, getting my last few sips of coffee before I get up here. I got my four and a half hours of sleep at least. Last night, four, four hours the night before that, seven children had taught me I don't need sleep. <laughs> and I just said, Lord, I just, I love these moments. I, I have no plans. I have no message. I have no clue what's the next words that are going to come out of my mouth. There's no script up here. There's just this. <laughs> I've decided to live that way most of my life. Come on, let's go. the first message that I gave, I said I'll never read from a script. I'll preach when you tell me to preach, Holy Spirit. And there's some of those moments where I just say, Lord, I just ask that you wow me. Give me a word. And uh, I said, Lord, I just... I want a revival message. Thank you. Lord. Something that just sets my heart on fire. Come on. Thank you, Jesus. You know, with all the talk in the States about revival, of course, we saw Asbury and the Methodist campus and 40,000 people a day toward the end coming out. People stood in line 12 to 16 hours. Just to walk into a building for just a few minutes. Because the presence of God was so thick. There was a level of unity that some had never seen. And here they are in, the, in a Methodist church. And there's Charismatics. There's Baptists. There's Atheists. There's Agnostics. All coming into a building because they've heard that if you walk into this place, something begins to happen to you. That there's a peace that passes all understanding. There's a joy of the Lord that erupts. And it started shaking America again. I know several revivalist friends who were a little offended. They had been preaching revival for years and years and years. Come and look at the revival we're doing. And then next thing you know, at a little Methodist campus. In Kentucky, all of a sudden, something began to happen. You know, that's not the first time that Kentucky's had a revival. There was another one that happened in the early 1800s. People from Boston, Massachusetts, with no newspapers, no Facebook, no social media to proclaim it. And all of a sudden, you find twenty to 30,000 meeting together in a field. This isn't just any field. This is still pioneer country. This is wild and grown, grown up forests and all this other stuff. And people, they said people would hang on to trees as the ministers would preach, crying and weeping, hoping to not fall to the ground. Imagine that, that the fear of the Lord was so strong that 
but men wept and held on to trees. You know, I, I grew up as an early teen reading the revivals of Wesley. I, I remember reading the stories where the wind of God would sweep through the meeting and people would fall out. It all started because John preached at five churches in one weekend and all five kicked him out. <laughs> he said, that's it. I will preach in churches no more. I'll go to the fields. And within months, thousands begin to congregate to hear this message. I remember one man decided he would try to try, climb a tree so that he could see John as he was preaching. And as it's recorded, a man said, oh, I wouldn't climb a tree. He said, well, I want to see the preacher. He said, well, apparently you've never been to a Wesley meeting before. And as he had climbed that tree to see John Wesley preach, a wind came and the spirit fell and the man fell from the tree. <laughs> See, I grew up listening to those, the reading those stories and reading about Smith Wigglesworth and reading about the Welsh Revivals. I just want you to understand you can ignore the last hundred years of revival history in America because here's the reality is that most of our revivals came from you guys. The first great awakening, the second great awakening, the Welsh revival even influenced the beginning of the Azusa Street revival. Even the current revival that we had just months ago, Asbury, John Wesley. This country right here is the largest exporter of revival that the world has ever known. The calling that is on Britain to set the world on fire for Jesus. Come on. I'm here to receive. I'm here to be inspired. You know, you used to have the motto, make the world England. The church took that here in Britain and decided to export that mentality throughout the world by sending missionaries to every corner of the earth. We have a world that is so broken right now, so perverse. Yes, it seems as though it is dark outside. But God is looking for virgins with oils in their lamp Amen. to run into the darkness. <laughs> he is looking for those who are willing to say, send me. I will burn for you. I, I will be a city set on a hill. I'll be the light of the world. Send me, God. As Wesley used to say, light yourself on fire and the world will come to watch you burn. <laughs> Light yourself on fire. Let the world come to watch you burn. This world may seem dark. It may seem perverse. As, as we can't even figure out which identity we are. What we were born with. We're male or female anymore. That's how perverse the culture is actually getting. But we have the answers. That's right. To an unbelieving world. But will an unbelieving world listen to a hypocritical church? What kind of Jesus has we, have we shown the world? You know, I, I, I say that all the time. We have 3,600 churches in my city. I said that when I was over in Denmark. And they said, we don't know if there's 3,600 churches in all of Europe. I said, well, we have 3,600 of them just in our state, in our city. Now that may seem, wow, fantastic, that's incredible, 3,600 churches. I call it 3,600 flavors of Jesus. 
<laughs> what it tells me is that the moment you get offended, you get broken, you go start your own version of Jesus. That's what it tells me. The amount of disunity within our city is it, it's it's wild. Thirty six hundred churches, and we can barely draw a hundred and fifty church leaders together. Less than one percent, or five percent. Think about that. Five percent. We need, yes, we need revival. But we need to understand that revival is the beginning, it is not the finish line. That's right. Revival just shows us that we didn't realize how dead we were. <laughs> yeah. That's really what revival is. Yeah. Revival just tells us that we haven't even taught the elementary principles within the church that Paul says in Hebrews chapter 6 repentance from dead works, faith toward God, doctrines of baptisms laying on of hands resurrection from the dead and judgment after death. The basic elementary principles of this gospel number one, quit playing with dead things quit playing with dead things see we stopped preaching a go and sit no more gospel. The first person to preach that was Jesus. Go and sin no more. That's not a judgment, that's an empowerment. He wouldn't have told someone to go and sin no more if they didn't have the power to do so. That's right. But then we turn around and we twist grace and I'm just a sinner saved by grace. I'm always going to struggle. I'm always going to have failures. I'm always going to have sin issues. No, that is the lie that has crept into the church. You were never created for sin. You were created for righteousness. We just think there's power, power, wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. And we reduce that to God to forgive us of our sins, but no, 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 He can never empower us to overcome them. That's deception. This book says whoever abides in Christ does not sin. So what's my goal when I wake up? Is it Ten Commandments? No, my goal is not to live by Ten Commandments when I wake up. My goal is to abide in Christ when I wake up. Yes, amen. And the more I behold the Christ, the more I behold the risen one, something begins to happen inside me. I find the things I once desired, I desire no more. Come on, that's good. <clears throat> See, when Paul talks in Romans chapter 7, he says, I knew not to covet. Until I heard a law say, thou shalt not covet. When you look into the law, guess what it does? It actually empowers a sin nature. Oh, how, how, how can you say that? Because Paul says it himself. Oh, death, where is your sting? Oh, grave, where is your victory? For the sting of death is sin, but the strength of sin is the law. I knew not. Thou shalt not covet. It told us the law that it said, Thou shalt not covet. It worked all these desires up within me to sin. Oh, wretched man that I am, how long shall I deal with this flesh? That was Paul speaking of the past, not his present. Because he turns the page and writes a new part of that letter that says, There is therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. For the spirit of the law of life has set me free from the law of sin and death. I've been set free from the law of sin and death. Second Corinthians chapter 5, he turns around and he said, or chapter 3, and he says, For the ministration of death, which was engraved in stones, oh, it had a glory, but there's a greater glory that has come, the ministry of life and spirit, and if you look upon that glory, it will transform you. To have looked upon that which was engraved in stones, it will kill you. It's there for that purpose and that purpose alone. The law was our schoolmaster.
Master that it would lead us to salvation. It would show us that no man is righteous, no, not one. All have fallen short of the glory of God. We have a better covenant. Thank you, Lord. The blood. That grace is not the covering for our sins, it's the empowerment to, to overcome sin. I don't need grace when I say I need mercy. I need mercy. That's what mercy does. Mercy covers my sins. Grace says, this isn't who you are. You were never created for that. But if we don't begin to understand what sin is doing to the church, it is crippling our very nature. And then we make excuses about it. We just say, oh, that's just, that's just who I am. That is not who you are. Come on. That's right. I'm just going to struggle. No, that is a lie. Power, power, wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. See, I find that the issue generally with people is they do not believe they're innocent. Oh, we see how precious is the blood of the Lamb has washed me white as snow. We sing this song. We talk about the cleansing of the blood. But we do not believe that we have been declared innocent. We still struggle with the issue. Are we innocent? See, something happens when you realize you're innocent. Something begins to stir inside of you the moment that you come to the realization, I am innocent. I am no longer a sinner. I am a son. I am a daughter. I've been redeemed. Yes. When you get touched with the love that shakes you to the core, and a fire gets shut up inside of you, when you walked into the eyes of Jesus and you find there's no other lover, there's no other thing in my life but Him. Something begins to govern your heart. And it's love itself. I don't need a wall that says, thou shalt not commit adultery. I don't need a wall that says that. You know why? I have covenant with my wife. I have relationship. Why would I want to put something that would break that covenant up? Why would I ever allow my eyes to wander in a way that would bring an end to that beauty and that covenant, that innocence that's there at this moment? And as I live a beholding her, as I look into my wife's eyes and I have communion, communion with her and intimacy with her, I will never put something in between that. And it is the same thing with Jesus Christ himself. Many Christians have never beheld. They've never beheld the Christ. They have a theology, they have a doctrine, they have a, a, an understanding in their heart, but they've never shed blood in their hearts. They've never had that deep inward communion that, oh, he's not just in the ground, he's alive. Many in the church still see Jesus on a cross. Not resurrected from the ground. He's alive. Come on. Lord. Many people are still worshiping a dead Jesus, not alive. When you see him as the risen, the risen one, the resurrected one. That's where the power begins to grow. That's when you choose, you know, today, I'm going to serve the Lord. Today, I'm going to spend time with Him. Today, listen, you cannot survive in this world just going to church on Sunday morning. That's right. The children of Israel were commanded by God to go out every morning and gather bread. 
Jesus and his instructions of the, of the model prayer. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give me this day my daily bread. You have to have daily bread. You cannot have a diet of Sunday morning. <laughs> you will not make it. You have to eat of him and feast upon the Lord every single day. That's right. That's right. You have to be willing to stop in the middle of your day and say, I, in this moment, find that I am unaware of you and I'm going to stand here until I become aware of you, Jesus. <laughs> Listen, the world needs men and women who are aware of Jesus. Something happens when we become aware of Him. The awareness of the Father, the awareness of Jesus begins to draw other people into that awareness. People are like, what are you talking about? At times, I go and I sit at places like coffee shops and people come up to me and start begging to know Jesus. Well, have you preached the gospel? No, I have not. Well, why would they just come to you and start begging to know Jesus? Because... As a 13, 14 year old boy, I stole a book from my pastor's office. It was called The Anointing of Smith Wigglesworth. And I read about this Welshman who would jump on a train, and as he was on the train, all of a sudden people would begin to cry and weep. Because he was so aware of Jesus. That people became aware of Jesus. People would start crying out, what must I do to be saved? <laughs> and I read that at 13, 14 years old, and I said, Lord, I want that. I want to become so aware of you that everywhere I go, I bring people into that awareness. And I get to see the most amazing things. There's not a miracle that you could actually ask that I probably haven't already seen. I was just in Germany the other day with some friends and they brought me to a coffee shop. I went to shake a girl's hand and she fell out in the power of God in the coffee shop. <laughs> they looked at me and they said, this does not happen in Germany. I said, it does now. <laughs> we got on the street and I reached around and touched one of them and he fell out in the middle of the street. They said, I can't believe this is happening. I said, what? I don't believe it. <laughs> My favorite line from Smith Wigglesworth was, only believe, only believe. The symptom of the church is an unbelieving heart. Yeah. Many of you could probably talk about testimonies. You could quote amazing things that possibly have happened that you've seen maybe with your own eyes, but you still find yourself spiritually dead. You know, the children of Israel saw the Red Sea part before them. They gathered manna off the ground. Quell was resting on the ground waiting for them to pick up in the morning. They saw Moses strike a rock. And out of that rock came a river. Over a million plus Hebrews were in that wilderness and they all drank from that rock. You know, Jesus was struck with a staff in the side, and water came out of him. He too was a rock. When he was struck on that cross, that rock that Moses struck, and that rock, which was Jesus, water gushed out of his side, and he said, Anyone who drinks of me will thirst no more. Yeah, come on, thank you. See, the children of Israel saw signs and wonders, just like many in the church. They saw a move of God that would, you would say, oh, I mean, if I saw a cloud by day and a fire by night, man, I would give my life to Jesus. I would know he was real. Forty years they saw a cloud by day, a fire by night. Their clothes never ripped, never torn. No one was sick among them. All infirmity was gone. Yet they griped and complained, they griped and complained. 
You know why? Because it says that Israel knew his words, but Moses knew his ways. On the beginning of their journey, God had a request. Let my children gather around me. Draw close to the mountain. The problem with men is they saw lightning and thunder instead of the glory of God. Two out of a million plus people, only two, looked at Mount Sinai and they did not see lightning and thunder. They saw the glory. And Moses said, I'm climbing up there. I'm climbing the mountain. I want to see his face. I want to see his face. Out of a million plus people, only one wanted to see his face. The difference between those who climb and see his face versus those who stand at the ground and wait for someone to tell them their experience. So at the end of the day, God spoke to Israel in riddles, but he spoke to Moses face to face. Wow. Yeah. I don't want riddles. I want face to face. I want to see his glory. Come on, yes. <coughs> Out of that generation, only three, two, because Moses himself did not walk into the promised land. Only two, Caleb and Joshua, of that generation. Got to walk into the promised land. And Paul warns us, do not be like our fathers. Who fell in the wilderness with an evil heart and unbelief. I, I want you to understand, you may have received a gospel that said, just bow your head and say a prayer. and You'll get to heaven. And I just want to tell you, that's not right. You all had another really good <laughs> Good pastor, I like to hear sometimes. I go back and I listen. Derek Prince. Yeah. <laughs> and Derek Prince had a message that said this. He said, Jesus is the way, but we've forgotten the destination. See, the church began to teach the destination as heaven. Oh, just bow your head and you'll get to heaven one day. That's not the destination. Jesus is the way, he is the truth, he is the light, but he's to lead us to one thing and one thing only, the Father. That's the destination. I came to what? To show you the Father. Rebellious kids need one thing, a Father. If I see rebellion in the church, it tells me one thing, they're absent of a Father. Not because he isn't there, not because he isn't caring, not because he, he isn't true. It's because the church was born into heaven instead of him. We've held on to escapism, praying for a better day, hoping for a better day, blessings, bigger houses, bigger cars. Instead of filled spirits. Do we really want Jesus? Yes. Do we really want to be aware of the Father? Yes. You know, I told told the people the other day, I, I did all my stupid things when my father wasn't in the room. <laughs> when my father was gone, that's when I did something stupid. When my father was around, there was a responsibility to act a certain way. I just knew, yeah, I don't even. To be aware of the Father carries responsibility. Do we really want that responsibility? Some people might say, yes, I, I want to be aware of the Father. Well, that responsibility means that you are not allowed to ever have unforgiveness and bitterness in your heart. To be aware of the Father says that any man that says he loves God but yet hates his brother is a liar. And the love of God is not in him. Oh, to say I'm aware of him. To proclaim to the world that I'm aware of God but yet not manifest Jesus Christ in everything I do is to call myself a hypocrite and call myself a liar. And this is what the church has been doing.
If you truly want to be aware of the Father, there is a responsibility to walk things out. There's a responsibility to carry the very character of who Jesus is. To manifest His good works. To heal the sick, raise the dead, cast out devils, cleanse the lepers. To go and see someone struggling and say, hey, there's a chair at my table, come sit at it. Let me tell you about the Father. The root of the issue in this generation and every generation before it is a lot of fatherless children. Like I said, he's not an absentee father. He's right there. And he will never leave you nor forsake you. Oh, you can never escape from his love. His love is for you. The banner over you is love. He desires an intimate relationship with you. He wants to father your heart. He wants to give you such boldness and such confidence. He wants to be the fulfillment of your life. His son in his son is the light and the life of all men. There is no life outside of Jesus. There is no fulfillment for your heart outside of Jesus. You will live your life broken and you will spend your life trying to find someone to fill the place that only Jesus Christ can fill. You will become a user of men and women. You will use their talents, you will use their love, you will use them as much as possible, hoping, desiring that you at the end of the day can put your head on a pillow and go to sleep with peace. But there's only one who brings the peace that passes understanding. Oh, thank you, Jesus. <laughs> there's only one who releases the joy of the Lord, which is your strength. It's only in His presence do you have freedom. I came here to stir revival in the city. Come on. I want to see a group rise up that said, I'm living for nothing more than Jesus. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. I'm sick and tired of the government telling me what I can do. I'm sick and tired of what the, the religious church is trying to tell me, what is acceptable and what is not. I'm tired of seeing pride parade, pride, pride flags on churches everywhere I go. Oh, We're giving the wrong representation of who Jesus is. Yes, Jesus is inclusive, but that inclusion includes that you must leave your dead nature at the door. Quit playing with dead things. See, the reason the church is involved is because they've lost the idea that they're See, it's in innocence that you have boldness. It's purity that allows you to be bold. If my heart condemns me, as John said. If my heart condemns me, know this, that God is greater than my heart. Oh, oh, yes. But if my heart does not condemn me, I have confidence with God. How many of you can honestly say I'm confident with God? And before you even attempt to comment on that, to raise your hand hastily, remember this, that confidence with God looks like something. Because it looks like Jesus. It looks like speaking to the outcast who had stolen much from Israel and climbed a tree to try to see them. Zacchaeus come down from the tree. Come, come eat with me. Matthew the tax collector. Nobody really liked him much. Matthew, come eat with me. Invite me to your house. I want to I want to have a conversation. You can't legislate Christianity. Our government has tried it. We still got a bunch of sinners. <laughs> when 
you throw a log in front of the fire. So let's face it, just makes their flesh a little bit more rebellious. <laughs> we have laws that say thou shalt not kill. In the States, people still kill. We're passing laws right now saying you can't commit abortions. But guess what? Abortions will still happen behind closed doors. Do you know why? Because the law can only try to manage flesh. You cannot change it. You cannot crucify it. Only the blood of Jesus can do that. Amen. You can try to manipulate and control your flesh all you want to. You can live your life trying to say stop it every day to the desires of your flesh. But there's only one thing that crucifies it. And that's beholding him. That's eating him. Eat my bread. Drink my wine. My boy. He wants to shake this place. Listen, I can. Last night, like I did last night, pull back the veil and I can, I can show you the supernatural reality that's here in this moment. And I might even do that a little bit. I can show you the war. That many in this room have no clues actually happen in this moment. I see it. I'm aware of it. And I think everyone here that was here last night would believe me on that. <laughs> We're at war every single day. With the world, what would you have? It's a simple question I ask myself all the time. Would the world want my marriage? Would the world look at my children and say, oh, I wish you raised my children that way? The fruit of your life, what is it? Is it counting down the days to get to heaven? Or is it about releasing heaven here on earth? See, we still got this idea that, oh, Lord, rent the heavens. He did 2,000 years ago. He rent the heavens. It's not heaven come down. It's heaven come out. If you accepted Jesus in your heart, and especially if you received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, heaven's inside of you. It's the Christ in you, the hope of glory. Come on. This is about everywhere you go, bringing people in to that encounter of heaven. That touch the glory of God. It says this earth moans and grows for the sons of God to manifest. Will you manifest? This earth demands it. It's groaning for you. It's a longing for us to return to what we were created to do. Which is take dominion over this earth and this ground. This whole thing started with a tree in a garden. It started with a place called Eden. And God said, Take this garden right here, the little leaven that can leaven the whole lump. A little of the kingdom. Oh, what a little bit of the kingdom can do. He said, Take this garden. Cultivate it, grow it, until it covers the face of the earth. The prophets talked about this, that the glory of God will cover the earth as the waters clothe the sea. And of course, we know the story, they ate of the tree, the knowledge of good and evil, and they were kicked out of the garden. But when Jesus redeemed this in the New Testament, I want you to understand there's a new garden of Eden. It's right here. Your heart is a garden. Imagine that Jesus would spend most of his time in parables talking about gardening. Either he was really obsessed with gardening or, <laughs> or he had a reason for it. The four types of soil are also known among early church leaders as the four types of hearts. The stony heart. The thorny heart. And your heart is the condition of allowing this world to define who you are. 
Do you let the birds of the air, the enemy, come and devour the seed that is sown in your heart? Do you allow the rocky soil in your heart to not allow the seed to go deep within the earth and so when the sun comes out, it scorches it and kills it? Or the cares and the deceitfulness of riches, as Jesus said, that choke out the life of the seed. See, each one of you have been given the seed, the incorruptible, indestructible seed of a living God. The very tree of life has been planted inside of you. Jesus said, truly, truly, barely, barely, I say to you, I go to the Father. Why? What to give us a mansion? It's a major truth. Mistranslation there. It's not about us going to heaven and getting a mansion. It's talking about I go to the Father to prepare a place for in my Father's house are many rooms. This is about you becoming a tabernacle, a temple, a dwelling place of God. This is about Him coming and saying, I am coming to live inside of you. As Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, that we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, he also says, do not yoke yourself with heartless. Do you not know that you are the very temple of the presence of God? When he tells Jesus, tells the woman at the well, you will worship me not on a mountain, you will worship me not on a temple, with nothing that man's hand could possibly make, but you will worship me in spirit and in truth. I will come and live inside of you. The moment you said, I do, Jesus, I do to this marriage, will you marry me? I want you to have my heart. He comes and he puts the seed of the living God inside of you. And a tree begins to grow and it's the tree of life. And he says, eat of me. But this flesh isn't yet redeemed and there's another tree. It's called your intellect. It's right here. The knowledge of good and evil, it sets right here. It's an enmity with God, it says in the Word. That your mind wars against the things of the Spirit. So you have to put on the helmet of salvation. Meaning that you have to renew this mind with the Word of God. If you want to survive in this thing, you better know His Word. It's the most fascinating book you can ever open because it's not just a book, it's life. I find most Christians try to survive on the word of the day. That's like having a plate with a P in the middle of it. <laughs> try surviving off of just one little green P. You're not going to go far. The word of the day will not get you through. David said, I hid your word in my heart. At least I sinned against you. And in your word... Is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Oh, how can I trust in the Lord with all my heart and lean not on my own understandings if I do not know His Word? Why well, don't hear God? You know, there's an easy fix for that. Read this until you hear it. Read it until you hear Him. Now, I believe there's a few in here that are getting pricked in your heart right now. You're feeling something beginning to stir inside of you. Some of you are on your own personal hells that many in this room have no clue you're going through. You've hid it from every single person, and when you lay your head at night to go to sleep, you live in hell. You are tormented by the works of the enemy. Trust me, I know. I see it everywhere I go. It is not uncommon for me to go into a meeting and preach the gospel and watch 15, 20 people start manifesting demons. That's just a normal service for me. That's why when I had a church, we didn't have offering buckets, we had puke buckets. Just trying to keep the floor clean, that's all. Because I believe this gospel. I believe the un-
unseen that is in this room right now, there is a heavenly battle going on right now for your soul. There is an enemy that has been encamped inside of you. Some of, for some of you, it's been since you were a child. And it is so intertwined with your very personality that you can't tell the difference between what is you and what is the demonic. And then there's something else moving in this room. It's called ministering angels. It's called the very presence and the glory of God that it's here, it's now, and it wants to deliver your soul from your pit of hell. I don't have 12 steps. I mentioned if I did, they would be called Jesus, 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 Jesus. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. I do offer you one. Colossians says that he rips us out of darkness into his glorious light. I just pull back the curtain and let the light of the living God come into the room and shine in darkness. But here it is, the condemnation of this world that sometimes men love darkness more than that. And they hide in darkness. Least their sins be made known. They would rather live in a prideful state of saying, oh, there's nothing wrong with and have to deal with the problem. There is something wrong with you. You don't want to give your whole heart to Jesus. I had a person ask me one time, they said, I prayed and I sought the Lord and, and, and he never came. I said, that is a lie. They said, what do you mean? I said, God's word will never return to him. He says, search me with your whole heart and you will find me. Search me with your whole heart, not the pieces. Ask. Seek. Knock. He says the kingdom of God is like a woman. An old widow who had injustice done toward her. And she showed up at the courts every day and begged for justice. And the judge would not grant her any. She wasn't done yet. She demanded her justice. So she went to the judge's house. She began to knock on his doors at the night. I want justice. And he said, I have to give this woman what she wants or she will drive me mad. <laughs> and Jesus says, that's the kingdom of God. Imagine that. God's looking for a people that are so desperate, so hungry, in such a need of him, he knows exactly where that breaking point is for you. When you push through the crowd, have you been to the doctors and they've said there's no hope for you? You've spent every penny, you mortgaged your house to try to get free and get, get healed. And then all of a sudden you find out that Jesus is in your city and so what do you do? The crowds are gathered around them. There's, there's no possible way I can get in. And, and all of a sudden this hopelessness begins to set in. But then you say, no, you know what? I'm going to push through the crowd. I'm going to get to Jesus. Even if I can just touch his garment. Even if he never knows that I touched him. If I just touch Jesus, something will happen. He's looking for those who will push through the crowd. If you're willing to give up, it doesn't show that he is not merciful. It doesn't mean that he is not graceful. That he has not a desire in his heart to come and set you free. It just means that you are more in love with yourself than you are him. I'm just bold. I don't have time to play. There's other places to go. There's other places to need the word of God. There's other people that are actually hungry and desire the word of God to be so implanted in their heart that they become a living epistle. I want his fire. Yes. You didn't come to baptize you with others. Pillows. Cups. Said I came to 
that touching the fire. He came to set you on fire, to burn away every impurity, all the dross, to so purify you by fire that you become a living sacrifice that everywhere you go, you burn for Jesus. And when people look at you, they don't see your flesh, they see the risen one inside you. <laughs> this world desperately wants that. They want to see something real. Yeah. They're tired of looking into their televisions. Think about that televisions. Tell me when they're changing. We look into those TVs and we're saying, tell me a vision. Give me a word. Give me a dream. Most of the people in this world find their aspirations, their dreams, and their motivations by televisions and films and TV, movies. They don't even know how to dream and hear all you know, one of the most amazing things that's happening right now in the world is where the church has actually failed. You know, one of the places the church has failed miserably? Going to the Middle East, going to the most Muslim populated countries and preaching the gospel. So Jesus himself had to show up. In places where they don't have necessarily televisions and entertainment, men are having dreams. And in these dreams and in these visions, a man in white comes to them. And Jesus himself proclaims the gospel to them. I can't tell you how many Muslims, ex-Muslims, should I say, have come up to me and said it all started one night as I'm laying in my bed in fear and desperation. And a man in white came into my room. shut the noise out. This world is just noise. So much noise. In America, there's even more noise. Everybody wants to be heard, be seen, be known, and all this other stuff. When we finally just turn off the noise. You know, one of the greatest evangelists that we walked this continent Came to Britain a lot, was from Germany, Reinhard Monkey, his father, was saved by a man who came to him in a jail cell, clothed in white, and preached the gospel to him. Imagine the lineage that would come. His Monkey's father never would have even imagined that that moment would lead to his son. Leading 72 million people to Jesus on the continent of Africa. These little moments where God shows up are very important. And we're going to have a moment where I'm going to allow those of you who feel pricked in your heart right now, those that may have said, you know what, I felt like I left my first love. I love Jesus. I decided I was more fascinated with the things of this world than him. Maybe some of you have never accepted Jesus into your heart at all. And I'm just going to invite you right now to stand up and come forward. Yeah. If you don't know Jesus in that way, get up here. Be bold. God rewards boldness. You know how he rewards it? Of course, grace upon the humble. 
He resists the proud. I'm looking for people who want to say, I want to shake the ground for Jesus. I want to shake the ground for Jesus. Send me, Lord. And it's sending, and it says, go therefore make disciples. 